Yes. All right, we will uh, call this meeting to order. Thank you, everybody, for finding your way here. We didn't think we had one or two stragglers wandering up and down the road, but I think Bruce got them all in here. Might send Kitty out to check in 10 minutes, see if anyone's still out there. But I think we're all here. So with that, we will call this uh, call this board meeting to order. And is Mr. Lambert here? Um, You're going to... Mr. Lambert, please. I am going to be Mr. Lambert, but I actually want to combine just a very, very, take about two minutes combine our uh, patient experience and rather than tell you about a story, I actually want to show you something and this is something practiced around Jed Metcon. I asked him just to give me a couple of pictures and this is what he did. But these I'll start both ways. But uh, these are these are just some pictures of what our nurses are doing outside again the four walls of Erlanger. And this is called Operation Homeland, where we partner with uh, at the National Guard Armory, and we do foot care. And we think we have the best in the world to do foot care because we had our wound care nurses, plus some of us older nurses, if you will, uh, got in our scrubs and did food more care. experience. More yeah. experience, nurses, absolutely. And did food care. So I thought you might enjoy seeing some of that. And I will tell you that day that we saw over 200 people and did good care over with 200 people and we gave them socks and some of them had shoes just so they could um, they do a lot of walking so they definitely needed that care Jim, where, where is that? Where is it's at the national guard armory yeah and we set up with several other uh, vendors such as uh, miller mott they did haircuts for them and things yeah. like that we did the foot care we were on the only health care that was there to do with it it was great. Too. And that's what we hear on the homeless. They either go and they want to complain. Right. The feet. Yeah. That's just amazing. It is. So what you were talking about. I thought y'all might enjoy seeing that. Okay. And so we wind that up then. Uh, we'll uh, ask you to bow your heads for prayer. Dear Lord, as we gather here today, we recognize we need your strength and guidance to move forward in the ways that would be honorable and humble in your sight. As we state our mission and vision, we ask for humility and seek to be as a drink of cool water to those that are weary, thirsty, seeking refuge, remembering that we are here to serve our patients and families. Blessings on the team working here tonight. Amen. Amen. With that, everyone uh, should have received and should have in front of them a hard copy of the agenda for this evening. Um, I will pretty quickly move into our special guest, although Bruce, you come to most of our board meetings, so it feels a little short-sighted to call you a special guest, you're usually with us. But for tonight, we're all going to hear from, uh, from Bruce. Um, I know you do this presentation for a lot of people, so hopefully it's well old and well rehearsed. But everyone here, if you haven't seen it before, um, I'm looking forward to getting an update on everything that we got going on because as we all know, we have 114 projects going on, and about 80 of them are probably running through your fingers one way or another. So, with that, I will turn it over to you. Great, Mr. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming to the depot, and especially thank the board members. You've had a lot of hours this week, mm -hmm. um, the whole weekend, and then coming here on a Thursday night. Um, the good news is I'm going to run through uh, the vision of where our master plan is, and we're not asking for approval. We're just asking for your feedback. And I would welcome you to ask questions as we go through this uh, at any point. And Karen, if you, you might, I turn the air conditioning on, it's probably getting a little too cool. If you could help me and just, and if you could click one of the light switches, I'm sorry. So, um, uh, the other one instead of that one. <laughs> Perfect. So Matt's been doing a great job of leading you all through and leading us through a, a, a master plan for the, the whole strategic plan. And he has always asked that we keep those strategic priorities in light of everything we do. And we've been doing that as it relates to the master plan. Um, we've actually are looking at what, what do you do to get the strategic plan embedded into the master plan. The master plan should follow the strategic plan. And we want to make sure that our, our master plan supports the, the mission, the vision, the values, and the business plans and institutional priorities. Um, we are not uh, an institution that can go out and borrow a billion dollars and do all of everything we need to in one fell swoop. So what we need to do is to do it incrementally as we have capital and debt and philanthropy. 
And I actually think that that gets you a better product because you have to really think long and hard uh, before you spend that money. Um, another key element that we've tried to incorporate is engaging all of the constituents in everything we do. The more people involved in a project, the greater the likelihood of success because people are vested in it because they've had a part in making it happen. And the last thing, and this is really important, if, you, if you're going to build a new building, and it, it could be a small ambulatory care center, it could be a surgery center, or it could be a children's hospital, aspire to be the new benchmark for others to follow. Don't just build another building. It doesn't cost more to do that, and it makes such a big difference, and it gets everyone excited. So that's the preamble. And you've all heard too much, probably, about age caps and patient experience. Um, to recap for some new board members, um, if you think about the role of the patient and, and qualifying the experience they have in a hospital state today, their, their role is getting greater and greater and greater, and it's probably good. But how does a patient measure their success in a, in a hospital experience? First, it's got to be safe, and you've got to have the anticipated outcome you came in for. That, that's sort of a pass-fail. You've got to have competent, compassionate staff. That's another pass-fail. You would expect a clean environment, good food, and then the last element is what we're going to talk about today, the built environment. And, and the built environment actually impacts all of those. The other exciting thing that I get excited about is if you, if you look at your average household and you look at people, what they spend on their home, on their built environment, it's 25% of your income to 50% of your income, depending on what you're doing and how far forward you are. Hospitals, in reality, don't spend that much on the built environment. 60% of our budget are people. So our built environment as a percentage of budget is only 5 to 8%. But that impact is very significant. And again, we all know that, that hospitals are not bricks and mortar. They're people in programs. And, and again, Kevin and this leadership team has done an incredible job of recruiting people to Erlanger. But the challenge, Chattanooga is a great place to live. But when you're recruiting people from all over the country and they're coming from great institutions, and they, they come to our campus on 3rd Street, and this is the view of the world-class Erlanger. It, it takes a, a gulp of faith to realize that there's more than the buildings that you see there. And I think, again, since we've created the vision and the future for where this place is going, it has overcome the fact that some of our facilities are not what you would hope to see on a campus. Just in the children's arena alone, 20 to 30 new pediatric faculty coming on board, maintaining the nursing staff, and a lot of that is because of the vision that, that Kevin and, and this leadership team has set for the future. So, background. So we've looked at, at, at the campus and, and how it should improve over a period of time. And we think that the best option, and this is an option that's evolved over the last couple of years, is a three-level component. The first component is the building that you see going up right across the street. And that's the outpatient center. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. It's opening in 2018, and almost three-quarters of it was funded through philanthropy, and the other portion through debt. The question people would have is, why would you do that as one of the first projects when Kevin arrived? And I, I won't steal your thunder, but, but the impact of a children's hospital on the community and the community's reaction to your institution is so significant. This was a doable, manageable project, $40 million, most of it from philanthropy, although it was the greatest philanthropic campaign that the, that the, the city has seen. Um, so it made sense, and it has the greatest impact. 50,000 kids a year are going to go through that outpatient center. So you're touching 50,000 families and, and other family members of those kids. So the next phase, this is where it gets interesting, would be this 12-story tower. And uh, we're looking right now at a feasibility study to determine how much philanthropy could we count on for that phase. Our, our estimate is somewhere around $50 million. That needs to be verified by doing a lot of interviews. We think that's a doable philanthropic goal. The total project's about $210 million. I'll explain a little bit more about what's in that tower. And then the last phase is the completion of a totally dedicated children's hospital. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine years out there, as we need more beds, and I'll explain in a second. So, first phase, the outpatient center on budget, on schedule. Uh, we are blessed, the team that we had working on East, the architect, the construction management team, same team that came here. So we know each other, we're working like a fine-tuned 
machine. Um, we are about a little under $3 million from the goal, the philanthropic goal. We're anticipating that will be met by the time we open the new building. Uh, you all know the story about making it really uh, fit into the, the Chattanooga environment, the roof line like the aquarium, the 1891 steam engine coming out the front door. We are a little cocky, and, and you got to be careful, but we are actually setting dates for the opening celebrations. Um, and uh, these, these are still tentative, but if you don't plan now, you'll, you'll not get there. And the most important dates are December 7th for the board and our major donors. We're going to transform the new building into a, a beautiful place for a party to celebrate everybody's efforts to get us to that point. The following Sunday, December 9th, it will be open to the entire community and we're going to have as many people come through that building to show them what has happened with their money and, and what's going on at Erlanger. And then the formal ribbon cutting on Tuesday, December 11th. We'll have about a week to do a final clean, and then we'll be open for business December 17th. Perfect timing because there's a little bit of a quieting down during the holiday season so people can get comfortable with the new environment. So this is a, a floor plan, and I, I put this up for a couple reasons. Um, just to let you know, on the first floor, that big dark area is a conference center, conference room that will be used for many purposes, uh, larger than this room. There will be a Cafe, uh, actually the uh, chicken salad chicks uh, entrepreneur won the competitive process to create the Choo Choo Cafe uh, for the kids up in that corner environment. Uh, nice lobby as you come in, admitting, laboratory. But this is really what I wanted to highlight. This is 11,000 square feet that was to have been the cranial facial center and was to have been funded through philanthropy that did not materialize. This was about two years ago. In reality, not probably not such a bad thing. Um, we're now looking at that as a pediatric MRI and three OR dental rooms and all of the pre and post procedure rooms to support that. This has a strong bottom line to it. It would take all of the kids out of the MRI across the street. Uh, we would have a simulation MRI unit so it makes them a lot more calm, totally different environment. Takes the three OR activity out of what's going on across the street. We don't have this in our budget. So what we're looking at is there is a contingency in this project, and if we manage our money well, there will be some money left in that contingency. We're going to try to build out as much of that space as possible, uh, and we're looking at additional philanthropy to make that happen. It may not happen the day we open, but it needs to happen at some point in time. Any questions on that? How much is it? Rough estimate is about two and a half million dollars of construction and a leased MRI or a purchased MRI, which is three million bucks, give or no, take. No, no, not quite that much, but no. it's, it's pricey. <laughs> <laughs> Two million. Well, but all of the other equipment to, to, to and outfit we're, the... We're yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Right now, we, we have about a million four, and uh, there are some options that are going to eat into that a little bit. There should be at least a million dollars that should be applied to this. Uh, but again, until you get closer to the end, you, you don't want to spend your contingency. Okay. <laughs> I think you might. The, uh, the upper two floors are, are designed based on the best of breed. We travel all over the country. We look at all of the newest outpatient centers, not just children's. And what we've come back with is that real estate is very expensive. There are no private offices in this building. Um, there are, there's a single waiting room on each of the two floors. There's a specialty area, this floor is radiology, on the other one is cardiology, and then there are three clinic modules on each floor. The patients come in through this way, through barn doors, and the staff are in the inner core. And this really enables a lot of working together on the part of the staff, but the patients and families don't get exposed to the, to the churn of what happens in a clinic environment. There's only one registration area, there are kiosks, so you don't have to go through the normal process if you're coming back after you've been in the hospital. So highly efficient operation. There's ebb and flow. If one clinic needs more space, they can flow over into the next clinic module. The other exciting thing on each of those waiting rooms, uh, we, we have something to create diversion. And uh, another, other, uh, this is the fun part for a second. So as you're going down 3rd Street, you see that little patio area. If you can actually see it today, it's, it's out there. And we wanted to do something special. Rock City funded it. They gave us $300,000 um, towards the whole building project. 
So we did a competitive process, and we wanted to find the best architects, artists, people that could really make something special happen. And we came up with uh, LME Architects, uh, who teamed up with Branch Technology. That's the new technology group that's using 3D printing to build structures. That's an example of what their robots produce, this thing right here. You can actually support 3,000 pounds on that. And they're actually developing a building that may go to the moon, made out in that same strategy. So <laughs> Branch Technology is going to be building 15 beautiful plants. You see these two cylinders? These are the stems. This is the actual size of the plants that will go out there. And the petals of the plants will be made out of their uh, 3D technology. Uh, we will have a Rock City birdhouse up there. There will be some sound art and play cores adding some elements. It will be lit at night. So it's going to be a very beautiful, unique environment for kids, families, and staff. So back to the waiting rooms. Each waiting room needs some diversion. And we didn't want to do the boring things that we find in most hospitals. So the second, or the third floor actually, um, will have this fire truck cab as you come into the waiting room. Uh, we have a great artist that's going to be painting the backdrop, so it will look like it's coming out of one of the old firehouses on campus. Yes. We just met with them today that just took this picture at noon. Uh, we're working on getting it repainted so it will look pristine. There will actually be a handicapped access in the back with a separate steering wheel. So kids in wheelchairs can access it, not just kids that can get to the front. On the second floor, we, we were struggling. Uh, we were working with the towing museum about putting a tow truck in there, sort of like the Mater, which we obviously couldn't touch because of Disney. And they, they just couldn't wrap their hands around what to do. And uh, we had some people go by this truck on Battlefield Parkway. And they, they, we contacted the owner. And it just so happens the owner, that was his original truck built in the late 40s. He has been a patient at Erlanger his whole life. Unfortunately, two years ago, he died at Erlanger. He married an Erlanger nurse. He is so, his son is so proud of the Erlanger connection. And we told him what we would love to do uh, to move that tow truck to the second floor of the hospital. Obviously, it takes a little bit of work. And he embraced it, and he said, I'll take care of it. His nephew works at Miller Industries. So this is the way it looked about three months ago, and this is the way it will look at the Believe Bash. Uh, they've totally restored it. Uh, we've taken it one step further. We've been accused of having too many male items. We've got the train, we've got the fire truck. So this will be a female tow truck, uh, named after his grandmother, Sally. Uh, and you can figure out how that gets determined later on. So back to the seriousness <coughs> of the project. Um, the next phase is, is probably the most important phase in the near-term history of, of Erlanger. So again, I think most of you are pretty familiar. This is 3rd Street. This is Hampton. We're actually in a building right over here. This is the health department. And the West Wing, that older building built in the 60s, is right here. So the thinking today is that we build a 12-story tower in between the West Wing and the East Wing. It would be wonderful if we could tear the West Wing down before we built that. The reality is that we know we need the beds. So we're making the assumption that the West Wing has to stay operational. There's 68 beds in the West Wing. Only 16 of those beds are decent size. The rest are not up to standard. But we can keep it operational. There will be challenges, but we can keep it operational. We would build this 12-story tower for about $210 million. And this is a rough estimate right now, $50 million from philanthropy, the rest hopefully from debt. So what would be in that tower? So we knew if, if it was only children's, there's no chance in the world that you could put that much resource into a children's hospital. So what we're looking at is 12 stories, and each floor would be universal rooms. Universal meaning they're all the same size, pretty much the same as the rooms at East. The top three floors would be NICU rooms. The next floor would be the PICU, the Cancer Center, Acute Care. And then there would be four other floors for other centers of excellence. And this is actually an interim move for the Children's Hospital. So I'll explain that in a second. So what this would do when it's finished is it would give us 216 beautiful new world-class patient rooms. It also would involve renovating a lot of the rooms that interact with this new facility that would add about another 100 <laughs> renovated rooms. So we would have more than half of the patient rooms at Erlanger brought up to contemporary standards with, with this phase of the project. Does that make sense so far? 
So you're, you're all familiar with the rooms at East? That's basically what they would look like. Same size, same feel. This is what many of our patients are dealing with today. Not just children's, but the adult side. Our, our patient rooms are not up to anything close to standard, with the exception of a lot of the rooms that, that John and his team have worked on and have brought up to standard over the past couple of years. The last phase, and this is five, six years out, uh, still about five years before Kevin retires. <laughs> What we would do is we would close Hampton Street, and I'll talk more about that in a second. The health department would move. We would take the children's emergency department, their ORs, the radiology department, and build a platform on the health department site and move the children's beds on top of the children's services. So we would then have a complete children's hospital across from the outpatient center, but we would only do that when we need these beds to complete the adult complement of beds. So these beds are universally designed, the, the decor would change, but they would then give us a tower of excellence for all of our adult services. At this point, the entire campus gets brought up to, quote, world-class standards. Any questions? Another interesting option. So you heard that we had looked at getting a hotel on campus, and we have several hotel developers that will do it in a heartbeat. Uh, they're ready to build it at no expense to Erlanger. We were looking at the corner of Central and Third on the back of the medical mall and Britt made us aware of the fact that we could not do a ground lease. So this is where HR is. This is where our Project Depot is. This is where you came to today. We're looking at the potential, and this is not in any way a done, done deal, uh, of building three levels of medical office space and the hotel built on the air rights. The hotel entrance would be on Hampton, sort of where you pulled in today. This could be the Neuroscience Institute. It could be other medical specialties. Um, we're talking with some donors and with the neuroscience people about the possibility of funding that through philanthropy. So it's, it's a work in process, but we wanted to share the vision of what that could look like and the impact that will have on our campus um, and the value of having the hotel built on our campus. So land is very valuable here. If we could get a functional use on the lower level and the hotel on top, that would make it even more <coughs> valuable. Any feedback there? And yes. as people come into the area and to have hotel for convenience for the patient, uh, Mr. Haas and I had discussions about how you even incorporate that vision and Ronald McDonald in there as well. Yep. And we shared this there with the Ronald McDonald of, There are a lot of um, <coughs> partnerships between hospitals and hotels and Ronald McDonald's working together. You could put part of your sleep lab in the hotel. Uh, the, the top, the middle floor would actually be the conference rooms that could be shared with the hospital, restaurant. And, and again, and don't forget that, I mean, this is this is Third Street. This is the beginning of the corridor that you know, right over the hill is downtown. Right. I mean, everybody downtown that's working on what happens downtown next knows we're right over the hill, and it's not a whole lot to connect everything. And right. there's there's nothing formal in place yet, but everybody's very curious. There's a lot of good conversations happening over what does Erlanger do? What do private developers need to do? What is the rest of the, the, the stakeholders? So there's more to follow on this. Again, not a done deal, but we're helping to visualize the, the future. And the other one who's been extremely helpful in a lot of the concepts and understand is Tim White and River City about also expanding Third Street and Fourth Street. Uh, so I, I can't. I got. I got to emphasize that Kim has been incredible. We posted River City and our partners on campus numerous times here. She was sorry she could not make it tonight. She had another event that she had to go to, but they have been invaluable. As keep in mind, Kim foundation. was on the board, yes. A lot of people didn't overlap with her, but Mike and I both overlapped. I think just Mike and I overlapped with her. But she was on the board and a very active and great board member here for a long time. So she, she's bought into the vision, for sure. Bruce, one of the things you didn't say as far as the outpatient center for children, the parking's going to be on the front. So over off of... Uh, what street is that? Hampton. And we will have valet parking right in front, handicap parking right in front, and then right. we are going to be doing some rearranging of our parking lots. So the lot behind us, which is now an employee lot, right. becomes a patient lot to support the new building. So it's going to be easy access. Absolutely. And so that's going to be a, a real positive yeah. 
And then what about when you when you do that second phase? Where's the parking going to go there? I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Good question. <laughs> so where's the front door of Erlanger? <clears throat> so one of the challenges we have is if you're coming to Erlanger, um, you may find your way to one of the valley parking areas, but they're probably going to be full by 10 or 11 o'clock. Then you find your way into a 2,600 car garage. You got to find your way up an elevator or down an elevator, go across the bridge, and then you're in the middle of a gigantic building with not a lot of daylight to orient you as to where you're going. So it's, it's a very challenging campus to find your way around in. So what we're looking at, and this is not something you can do right away, when you go to the mall, there's a whole series of entrances. You know which store you're going into. You can park pretty much in front. That's ultimately where we have to go to on our downtown campus. So how do we get there? So as centers of excellence are being defined, those become the front doors to each of those centers. So the signage announces you've arrived. There's a, a, an attractive lobby. There's valet parking right in front. And this is something that's very attractive on the philanthropy side. It, it doesn't have an immediate return on investment, so you couldn't do a pro forma saying, how could we do something like that? But as we start to look at philanthropy with the other centers of excellence, this is something that should be incorporated into that thinking. So we just did some rough ideas. So our cancer center today, you've got to sort of go inside, and that's the entrance to our cancer center. For not a lot of money, when the cancer center goes through its next iteration, there could be a grand entrance to your cancer center. Orthopedics. This is the corner of Central and Third, which is a loading dock and a parking lot. This, if we needed additional space, could be added to the end. Brand new elevated, take you up to the second floor, renovated orthopedic space. You're creating a front door, valet parking right in front. As Children's moves out of the Masood building, this could be the entrance to the Heart and Lung Institute. And again, with cosmetics and, and architectural facades, you, you, you know you've arrived at a world-class center. And even the medical mall. Uh, over time, it's, it's hard to know where the entrance of that is. It's, the signage is sort of behind the trees. So this is not something that needs to happen right away. It's not critical. But as we do renovations and start to think about our campus, we've got to make it more like coming to a mall. A little bit about all of the other items that are going on right now. Uh, Tana's got a whole bunch of CONs out there. We're talking about critical access hospitals in Sequatchie Valley. As we do all of these satellites, um, we need to be careful about making sure that the architecture and the buildings are consistent with the airliner brand. And there's a lot of latitude there, but you don't want to just do a whole bunch of stuff all over and have no commonality to it. You want to make sure they're all designed by incorporating best practices, doing site visits, making sure they're highly efficient. Um, you want to have the best teams putting it together, and you want them, again, to be the new benchmark for whatever kind of facility it is. Not just another critical access hospital, but how do you become the leader, the best that's out there that others want to go see? Speaking of off the campus, uh, East has been a great success for a whole host of reasons. New Cancer Center will be opening up soon. Uh, we did a master plan to see where additional expansion could happen at East, because there's demand at East. And the space, the building above the ED, uh, could have two floors of beds. So you could build 40 beds on top of the ED. You'd have to move the, the doctor's offices that are there. And there are options for that. The operating rooms and the procedure rooms, which we just opened up a year ago and are going gangbusters, they were designed so that you could do a mirror image going out to Gun Barrel and sort of do another four ORs in a procedure room. We also have two shell spaces in this building, and I'll talk more about them in a second. Um, the one concern that we have to pay attention to is that we, we need to add more density to this campus, but you don't want to tip it to the point that it becomes a mini airliner where it's challenging to get around, you've got to build structured parking, and you lose some of the value that makes this campus so special. So we have a master plan, and I won't bore you with all the details, uh, but there are some good options to, to continue to grow it, but there's a tipping point, and we've got to make sure we don't exceed that tipping point. There are two shell spaces on the lower level of the lobby space in the building, purposely built. When we built the patient care floors, you knew you had extra space. 
Shelf spaces are wonderful because you don't know the future use in a year or two. Uh, there are strong requests that we make one into a conference center and the other for the heart and lung to create a wellness center, a cardiac rehab. Um, a uh, demonstration kitchen ties in with our walking path. You can do the exercises out on the putting green. It all works. It does not make economic sense. I mean, you can't do it pro forma and say, all right, if we invest three quarters of a million dollars in this, we're going to get a return. We have to look at it like that. On the other side of the coin, a great philanthropic opportunity. Not that much money in the scheme of things to have your name attached to creating these two centers for the community. So that's the way we have to look at going forward with some of these strategic areas and some of the centers of excellence. Another situation has occurred. Um, if, if you go to a lot of campuses and you look at what they're doing and you look at the retail malls, the retail malls are struggling. Uh, the whole idea of retail use is, is changing. And Vanderbilt did a great job. They took the 100 Oaks Mall over. They took the second floor of it. They moved most of their outpatient services there. It's about 15, 20 minutes from the main campus. I've had a chance to experience care there. It's nice. It's pleasant. So we have that opportunity. Um, Ryan, who has been working with CBL for a while, uh, opened up the door. And uh, CBL is taking over the Sears property. Sears is going to be going out of business or leaving that site. They're looking at how to reconfigure what they're doing, more restaurants, a hotel, other elements. And we have an option of, of putting an ambulatory surgery center there and some physician offices. Uh, we're working with, with Ryan, with Rob. Matt's done a great job of pulling together some of the clinical practices. Last night we met with ENT. A couple of days ago we met with plastics. And we're running the idea by them. This is not a done deal. doesn't necessarily make sense, but it's an interesting option. Uh, one of the concerns, and, and Tanner can speak more about it, is the reimbursement when you leave the hospital campus is not as good as when you do an ambulatory surgery center on the campus, so that's an issue. One of the concerns the ENT guys brought up last night was during the holiday season, it may not be as easy to get to this site, even though they're going to be building a new ramp. They're building a separate exit and entrance directly into this area. So, again, no done deals, but an interesting option that would differentiate us in the market. Is that the Sears building now? No, this is a rendering of what could be on that site. Right now they're thinking they would actually leave the building and renovate it. <coughs> Last but not least, um, the University of UTC has been talking about a medical science building. And um, we have been really fortunate, uh, the chancellor and his senior management group and Bruce and others have had three or four meetings in this room. We were noodling through where would be the best location to put a 200,000 square foot building like this. And it just so happens, um, this is the parking lot across from CSAS playing field. And right now the health department uses it and uh, the university uses it. And we sort of centered on that as an ideal location to put the building. We took it a step <coughs> further, McCarthy just finished building this building for Georgia Tech. It's a medical science building, 200,000 square feet. So we took it and we plopped it down excuse me, on that site and said, wouldn't that be perfect there? And I think it helped all of us to visualize that. But then your, your question, Jim, where would you park? So again, in our meetings with River City and Kim and uh, Lindhurst Foundation, we came up with an interesting potential. And you have the CSAS athletic field that's sitting over here. It is about three levels below street level. It's in need of work. So this, this gets complicated. But uh, with Mayor Coppinger in the room and the, the leadership and the chancellor, we talked about the future of Erlanger and wouldn't it be great that eventually Erlanger would take the, the health department site to put the final phase of the expansion of all of these buildings on that site. That would mean the health department would have to move. So where would it move? And this is where River City came into the, the discussion and they took us on a site visit to Nashville. And in Nashville, they had an old health department building, same age as ours, and they had HCA who wanted that site. They did a land swap, they built a brand new, highly efficient health department building that's beautiful. So again, none of this is a done deal and there's a whole host of reasons why it may or may not work, but it's an interesting vision. What if? the health department moved on this site. What if when UTC built, it, built this building, it, it incorporated 
a piece or a portion or the entire portion, the portion of the health department. You're training a master's in public health, and here's the health department. You're training physicians assistants, you're training nurses, and this is the whole campus right here. So interesting idea. A lot of reasons why it may, may not work. Uh, the exciting thing is that we had Mayor Coppinger in the room, and the chancellor went through all of this with him. And at the end of the presentation, he said, so what do you think? And he said, I, I don't know where the money's coming from. I don't know how we can do it, but, but who am I to get in the way of this kind of progress? So interesting discussion. Um, more to follow. So that's the vision of, of where we would do the parking. It's the vision of where the health department could move someday. This is, this is five, six years out. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Last but not least, this is the vision that we've had for 3rd Street. 3rd Street's going to go through a makeover uh, across from the medical mall. I think you're all familiar with four office buildings that, that have had very productive use over the years, but right now do not enhance our campus. Um, and as you may or may not know, Molly Seals sold her building to Chattanooga Cares. Chattanooga Cares is looking at some options. A developer, Chestnut Realty, local well-known developer, has an option to buy Ken DeFore's property. Uh, there are multiple developers that would love, and then one other interesting discussion item, Hospice is leasing beds and space in Siskin, and their lease is up in about two point something or other years. So what if Chattanooga Cares, Hospice, and other development were put on this site, mixed use, retail, medical office space, housing, uh, have a dense use of that very valuable site, and then after that filled up, these two properties are also in play. So none of this is a done deal, none of this is certain, but it's starting to shape up that, that we could have a pretty exciting component across the street with no hospital equity in it. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, what we did with this building, this was the cabinet shop. Then it was storage for the emergency preparedness people. And then instead of us leasing trailers for the construction, we transformed it into this. And it's really turned out uh, better than we ever thought. Not only do we have all of our construction meetings here and our user group meetings, but we've hosted a whole bunch of people. And by putting the master plan on the wall and bringing in all these groups, every time a group has come through here, we've learned something, we've tweaked it, we've changed it. It's really made uh, an, an evolution in the planning process. So we thank you for coming today. We would encourage you to bring anybody through here and show them what's going on. And this, this is a plan that's meant to evolve and get better and better. This is not the plan for the future. This is a vision for that plan. You can clap. Questions? <laughs> Somebody want to press the red button just to stand up? press the red button? Uh, Dr. Jackson. I don't want to press the red button. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll be in my orientation not to press red buttons in the hospital. Oh, that's right. Can you tell me how the park can begin? Sure, if, if we could turn the lights on and hold the football field. Yes. So again, coming down 3rd Street. I'm sorry. This is CSAS Athletic Field, right? Three levels below. You could build three decks of parking and bring the athletic field to street level. And we actually, we used it as a student presentation for all the engineering schools. And we said, what if you wanted to turn that into a garage, but what if in 10 years you didn't need it? What could you do to how change the garage into a garage and then change it into classrooms, housing, laboratories? So we have a lot of great information that was developed out of that discussion. Uh, Lindhurst Foundation has been a party to this. So again, the economics of this are challenging. Um, but you're going to have to pay for parking somewhere. And here's where Lyndhurst got excited. Um, they have brought in an expert in developing uh, economic development in, in cities and towns. And they're looking at what grants would be available. When you have the health department, Siskin, Erlanger, and the university all benefiting, as well as the city. You could make a transportation center here, have a shuttle going from downtown. UTC could use it on the weekends. How do you make something like this work? Where could you get debt capacity that wouldn't tax ours? We don't have the answers, but, but it's pretty exciting, and we have some people that will help us sort our way through it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I, I think that, that definitely underlies, for me anyways, why it's important that we 
that we keep the ship headed in the right direction. We keep, you know, we, we had some good discussion up at Swanee about you know our bond ratings versus our growth rate versus how we invest and where we invest. You know, it's it's a very complicated decision matrix, but it's really important because if we do it right, we might be able to do some or all of this. If we do it wrong, we're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments for Bruce? But it all starts with a vision. Absolutely. And this is clearly a vision, and we do have a vision for the future. Great. So, so that be part of it. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Um, moving on to review the minutes from our February meeting. Um, hopefully everyone has had time to review them. <coughs> and if there's any comments or additions or corrections to the minutes, we'll entertain that. Otherwise, we'll look for a motion to put those minutes into the record. So moved. Second. Second. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed or abstaining? Thank you very much. On to committees. Mr. Haas, did budget and finance meet? No, we did not. Mr. Griffin, did planning meet? Yes, we did. <laughs> Several times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, anything on the, no, no resolutions though? No. Okay. Um, Mr. Smart, audit and compliance? No, we didn't meet. Uh, Mr. Webb, did legal? Yeah. Mrs. Mines. No, we didn't. And the executive committee did meet, but no resolutions for consideration. I will go back and say, because I know several people in the room have been involved in this, but uh, we're set to meet uh, prior to our next board meeting in April. And one thing we're going to try to tackle are the vision and mission statement. So I think um, probably need to get that sent to you. So so we should all expect something maybe before the board Just meeting. Just the committee members. Committee members, okay. Great. Okay, any other unfinished business? All right, with that, uh, Mr. Goodrich, Resolution 18301. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the past several months, uh, management has apprised the board on its intent to file a CON for radiation oncology services in Catoosa County, Georgia. As you're aware, management filed the CON on February 26, 2018. I'm before you today with a resolution whereby the board is confirming management's actions of filing a CON for radiation oncology services in Catoosa County, Georgia. And so with that, I'd like to open it up and answer any questions that the board may have about this filing. Well, will that CON be reviewed? It's it's currently under review. It is. So, so, so the process is 60, 60 days out um, after filing. So 60 days from February 26th, just um, so over a week in the first week after. Then we will have a discussion uh, with the Department of Community Health. They will ask us to clarify um, any questions that they might have. We have 15 <coughs> days to respond. And then after that, they have a review period of another I think I said 30 days, Jeff, after the 15-day the, the review period, another 30 days. And then you can have opposition hearings, and then you have 15 days to respond after an opposition hearing. And then uh, after, the, after your response, they have another 15 days to approve. So it would be, I mean, it's a 120-day process. So the resolution is just to formalize what we were in effect already doing. And reaffirm management's commitment to Is there a location already defined, or is it yes. that you have a general vicinity? That no, you, in the state of Georgia, you do have to name a site. Okay. And so we have we have property that we already own, um, right you know, where Erlanger South is, our primary care office right there. So directly, uh, would, it, would it be uh, west, um, right in that space, we have... Um, I think about 10 acres. Um, I just want to make one comment on this. You know, given given the sort of, uh, we have a lot going on. We have a lot of CONs going in, and you know, for everybody on the board, CONs don't commit us to anything. They, they give us the approval, but they will come back and ask us for either budget approval or if it's not in the budget, actual approval if it's an out of cycle expenditure. Um, I know we have a lot going on, um, but Jeff, Greg, everybody, let, let's make sure that we have a very clear process for what we as a board need to do before a CON is filed. Um, let's make sure that we have the board aware of them. 
ahead of time so that we can get all of, uh, you know, we had to approve one in executive committee one a month, which is, look, I understand things like that are going to happen, but we've had two here that we've kind of not done perfectly. Let's button up our process and make sure that we understand and have clarity across the organization for whenever we do a CON, we know how they need to go, we know when they need to go, and again, I know we're in a competitive environment, we need to be very flexible and very agile, but let's let's use this as an opportunity to get better. Okay? Fair enough? Thank you. Any other questions? So you just need a motion? Yeah, yeah we, need a, we need a motion. So Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Thank you, Darren. Dr. Sizemore and Dr. Jackson, resolution. So yeah, this is resolution 18-3-2. Um, this modifies the delineation of privileges for the Department of Radiology. Uh, it's a very minor change, but it would allow uh, radiologists to perform short uh, to be the attending of record for a short short-term inpatient stay following a radiologic procedure or allow uh, them to serve as the attending of record for a patient coming in the night prior to a procedure. Okay. So previously it was not included in their delineation of privilege. So they had to go get another doctor to be the right. Correct. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. So I'll make a motion to approve that resolution. So I, I want to, does that make sense to everybody what we're doing here? Okay, now the, the, these changes are minor, but they're important we understand them, so thank you. So we have a motion, do we have a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed or abstaining? Thank you very much, Dr. Sizemore. Um, as always, we have our information items, um, and Pam is available for questions if needed. <coughs> With that, I will move on. Oh, Dr. Sizemore, you're up again. I have no report. No report. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shack, do you have a Dean's report? I do. Just very, I'll be very brief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are, we've just completed the match for the residents who will be beginning their training here at Erlanger beginning July 1 of this year. A very successful match. All of the programs filled completely with no, no vacancies, so it's very good. And the quality of the residents that have matched here are, are very, very good as well, so I'm very pleased with that outcome. Um, we're also still in the midst of several searches, as you all know. We've talked about this at the last couple of meetings. We have just about wrapped up the search for the new uh, associate Dean for Research and the uh, Director of the uh, Erlanger Research Institute. That individual signed on the dotted line. He's scheduled to start work on uh, May 1st and probably will be here a little earlier than that actually. Uh, the pediatric chair uh, position and CMO of the Children's Hospital, we've identified our finalists. We are in negotiation with him. We just sent another letter to him, another counter offer back to him. Uh, and so I think that he, I think we've satisfied everything that he wants and he should be signing on the dotted line and Dr. Jackson may want to make a comment about that. No, I agree with you, Bruce. Yeah, so I think we'll have him signed up quickly. How soon he can get here, we don't know yet, but he is currently a chair at the University of Louisville, so we'll have, he'll have to get extricated from his current responsibilities there before we can move him here. But he's, I think he's going to be willing to sign on the dotted line, hopefully by tomorrow. The urology search, which is meant to be an internal search, kind of got spilled out because somebody from Rutgers saw the ad and applied for the job. So we're going to interview that guy next week uh, by Skype or Zoom, and then the committee will make a recommendation. But my hope, and I believe what will actually happen, is that the committee will recommend that since we have a very strong internal candidate who's built a very strong program here, that they will recommend the uh, appointment of Dr. Singh into that role and not the other candidate, and then that, that'll make it quick. Family medicine search is another internal search. I mean, uh, family uh, emergency medicine is another internal search, which we should be able to complete within the next three or four weeks and then get Dr. Sude Mandarada appointed into that chair very quickly, uh, replacing uh, Dr. Seberg, who was the, the former chair. And then, um, and then the, the, the family medicine search has also been launched. Uh, the search committee's met twice now. They've been they've had their charge from the uh, Office of Diversity and Equity, and so we are now starting to look at candidates. Uh, that that process will take a little while, but I mean we will get to it and have a very excellent uh, candidate. Uh, and Mr. Speaker may comment about this as well, but we are we are making extremely strong and positive progress in the conflict resolution uh, discussions, and we're very, we're nearing the end of that, and hopefully we'll be able to come to y'all within the next month or so and say everything's done. 
Okay? Good. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that, that any of the board members might have. So. Great. That sounds like Thank you. progress yeah. is being made. Any questions for Dr. Shack? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Mr. Spiegel. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. i um, proud to announce we have re formally received a rating from Wall Street. Moody's rated us again, uh, reconfirmed our rating of BAA2 with an extraordinary positive outlook. Um, so that's really good. Our Fitch rating is triple B plus with a stable outlook. And that's really good for the future of the hospital to have real solid Wall Street ratings. <clears throat> Southside Clinic relocation to St. Elmo. That we're really proud of. Uh, hopefully everybody's going to be able to join us on the grand opening on April 27th at 11 a.m. This is a wonderful facility and a great addition to the community. Heart and lung. Um, the ribbon coating was successful, and the heart and lung symposium, 4, 000, I mean 400 um, attendees for the symposium of doctors, nurses, and pre-hospital care providers were in attendance, and it was an overwhelming. We had national experts from all over the country to come here to talk about our program and what are the cutting edge technologies in medicine. Um, Murphy Medical Center, we will assume full responsibility. Um, it's a member substitution where this board then becomes the fiduciary responsibility of Murphy Medical Center on April 1st. Stephanie Boynton is leading that uh, initiative with Rob Brooks and his team. Um, and hopefully they, we will be announcing soon that we will have a new CEO for Murphy. The Believe Bash is our annual philanthropic um, event, and that takes place on April 14th. I would like to see everybody in full attendance um, at 6 p.m. We already have a thousand reservations for that event, so please get your reservation in early, um, and I encourage everybody to attend. Mr. Chairman, that is my report. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any other reports unless anyone feels called for it. I will, as always, point everyone out to your upcoming committee meetings um, over the month of April. And with that, we will adjourn. Um, what, before we adjourn, we're staying here for our closed credentialing meetings. Okay, so we are, we are going to. Uh, we'll take five minutes to mill about, and then we will. Hopefully, promptly return to this table and reset, and we'll have our, our closed session. Thank you very much.